Hello. What a pleasure it is to have you here. Seems, seems like you were talking about somebody else. Why is that? Because there's a lot of things there. <laughs> this is what you've done. I know. I, I tend to uh, think about the next thing. Mm. More. We don't. Saves. You don't rest on your laurels. No, but th- it's funny. You know, I probably would have made more money if I had. <laughs> I, th- I know some people who curate their uh, their thing uh, forever, and then it, it you know kind of squeeze squeeze it dry. Sure. But then they kind of like new run, forms run of had big merch. Mm-hmm. Probably. I mean, it probably could have done that. Uh, but it was always just a fun thing. You know, it was always uh, and also. We didn't think ahead. We just did what our that version of it really as well as we could, and then oh great movie, great it was awesome. You know, it wouldn't be made now. You know, the the climate movie making climate is. I want to get to that, but I'm curious about you saying that. It sounds like you're talking about somebody else. Do you do you not yeah. feel as accomplished as you are? Oh well, you know, accomplished is probably not a useful thing to feel. Um, I like the term. Uh, free to do stuff that you like and re- and respect it is great. Accomplished feels like it's somebody else to decide. Mm. I was asked for but, my but, papers but, to be, if I wanted my papers archived at a university. Wow. And I was like, I don't know if I have any papers. Yeah, right. I have, you know, because I was like the first. Like a president. <laughs> exactly. Yes. And I was like, what is that? I was like, it's flattering, you know. But, you know, I'm the first generation of, people where all their writing was on computer because I actually went to college in 81 and we had the Apple II. (laughs) So I really started on a computer, which uh, way back. So uh, it's kind of funny to think of that. But I guess they say those digital formats are uh, are collapsing. You know, like they may not last the way actually celluloid and even tape can last. So, uh, and paper. So it's kind of like, weird. I know, Full I feel circle. old. Well, does I was going to ask you if, if accomplished, if that word makes, yeah. you, makes you feel old. Makes me feel uncomfortable. I'm, my mom's Scottish. You know, you don't talk about too many fancy things because then you're like, oh, you're getting ahead of yourself. I need a huge head and all that. <laughs> right. Yeah, so I don't like to talk about that. But I feel good. I feel proud of this production uh, on Broadway, which I... Was more of a, a Godfather, you know. I didn't direct it, but I was kind of in there. It's weird. The production is a revival, and and it one the one of the four Tony Awards had big one was for best musical revival. I mean, this is a category uh, that recently named Porgy and Bess, Anything Goes, <laughs> Pippin as its winner. I'll take it. How do you feel about having joining a list like that? I feel classic. Um, it's funny because we were always the you know the dirty underdog uh, when we first came out, and the theater community was sort of afraid of us. The non-theater community came, rushed in and loved it. Uh, But the regular folks were, there'd be many shows where there'd be silence, you know, and, and, you know, confused silence, Uh, which is where I was imagining the film, because I imagine the film was more Hedvig in in weird uh, uh, restaurants and things where people aren't sure why she's there. Uh, So there's something cool about being a stealth classic in, for some people, you know, and it's still a small minority. Uh, but, you know, it's a new musical on Broadway, but they have a, a they came up with a rule when Little Shop of Horrors came in 15 years after they first opened off Broadway, and they were like, well, you can't win those awards, you know, because we got new shows. And it's a money game with the Tonys, you know, because a lot of the people voting are presenting it on tour. So they want to have the Tonys so that they'll sell in Peoria. Did your mother teach you this too? Down, Scott, downplay it's the... All, no, she taught me the business too. She's like, don't spend anything you ain't got. Right, right, right. And just get on with it. But did you 16 years ago, and admittedly it was a, it was much more of a curiosity and, and, and controversial and not necessarily um, acclaimed when it first uh, came out as a play. Did you imagine that um, Hedwig would resonate this way a decade and a half later? I imagine, I saw things changing. Um, I knew why. The thing is, we actually were critically hailed. We were never a big hit, though. We just kind of hung on, you know, like a chronic cough or something. And for two years, and you could do that then. Off-Broadway is different now. Um, And then the film was a fluke because the guy who ran New Line Cinema had directed me in a film in the 80s, and there was an affection and there was a kind of like, it doesn't really happen anymore that one guy built a studio and 
mm. and says, I'm going to make a film with you, you know, like Louis B. DeMillers or something like that. It doesn't happen anymore. It's a it's a uh, metric, right? How many can you sell? Foreign rights, da da da, you know, all of that. Can't have too many uh, Americanisms if you're going to have a big budget because China won't get it. You know, it's all very businessy. So, like I said, the film wouldn't have been made now. Um, so there were things that were good about then, uh, even though the transgender stuff was radical and the punk rock on, in theater was radical. Um, since then, Broadway has had American Idiot and this and that, which, you know, eased, eased the way for us on Broadway. And trans, you know, and drag uh, is not is everywhere. Let me explore that. First of all, um, I'm just looking at the stat. Last week, Hedvig grossed over $1 million at the box office. Which is crazy. Last week. And that's only with seven shows instead of the usual eight. And that's Neil. You know what that is? What? Accomplished. No, that's the wrong <laughs> word. That is a hit. It is a hit. There's no doubt about that. How Which pro- I never had. How provocative was it in the beginning? I mean, let me just, for, for any audience members who don't know the, the, the original play or the film or haven't seen the Broadway reincarnation, Hedwig is about, about an East German singer retelling the story of her life, including the botched sex change operation that left her with an angry inch. Right, and she was a boy who didn't really want a sex change right. or, or had no problems with gender or sexuality. I mean, somewhat provocative by today's standards for Broadway. How how, how cutting edge, if you use that term, was it when you originally performed it off-Broadway in 1998? Well, it was unusual for an off-Broadway show, but, you know, in the 60s, anything went in New York, so it's not in the 70s. You know, it wasn't that radical. In fact, the structure is quite linear in Broadway. You know, we got the 11... It's a musical, yeah. Yeah, we got the 11 o'clock number, the opening number. It's quite traditional in terms of form. Uh, It's in the form of a rock concert, though. She's telling her story. Uh, What was unusual was some of the content. But, uh, you know, compared to Short Bus, my next film, it feels very warm and fuzzy and grandma you know mm-hmm. it's, so it's like you know it's always uh did relative it feel, john did it feel like Hedwig was ahead of its time i mean did you have a sense that the world was going to catch up to Hedwig somehow yeah i mean some things i knew were going to get better <laughs> you know, other things ugh, you know mm. uh strangely uh what are the other things you know the environment <laughs> the economies of the world you know it's like this is the first generation where young people have been finally told uh, that things are maybe not going to get better. Some things are getting better, you know. Uh, weirdly, as you know, you you spiral into larger issues like, like a you know, economy, environment, religion, politics, things like sexuality and gender. Hopefully. Oh, well, that's just that, you know, it's just part of life. You know, it, you start to, you know, it's like mortality concentrates the mind. You know, all those problems you have with your parents, when you're, when they realize they're dying and you realize that you're dying and they're, the stupid things go away. Mm. Like the fact that in America you're Republican or Democrat. It's like it goes away if there's love, you know. So to me, there is love uh, in the story of gender and sexuality, it's involved. There's family involved, and those things w- are getting better. And I knew it would get better, and there will get better in around the world. Uh, and there's other issues to deal with after that. I actually think fixing some of those issues with gender and, and sexuality can help with other issues in terms of other kinds of conflict about otherness. How so? Well, I, I really believe people need. Uh, someone to be whipping boys, whipping girls, you know, it's looking for, you know, scapegoats, immigrants, you know, people in the States, you know, the hardcore people, it's like, will equate to the immigrant with the sexual outlaw, Hmm. you know what I mean, with the terrorist even. They're all other and they're all somehow coming to get me, my job, my cherry, you know, whatever it is they want to get. And it's equated for some frightened people who have uh, kicked into the Fox News way of... Uh, An extension of xenophobia. Yeah, and, and you know, Roger Ailey's and those people love to lump them for business reasons, you know, all the fears. 
So if I can get the fear of the terrorist together with the fear of the thing, then we can get reelected and da da da, and really do what we want to do, which is just lower the taxes and make more money. They don't really care about sexuality. You know what I mean? They're just, it's all a, you know for those people. There isn't a moral code in that one third of some, America. That's the oh, Bible Belt. Not or? the people running the Fox News and oh, and and the politics. They don't really care. You know the hardcore believers for sure. You know and. Those are always being co-opted by the, you know, the there will be blood money people. Hmm. You know, there's always a deal. Uh, it's surprising that the deals lasted this long, you know, in in the U.S. Um, I don't know. You know, I've been hearing more and more about uh, about Harper from my Canadian friends, and I'm like, wow, this really sounds like what was happening in the '80s with Reagan, uh, a kind of, but with a different personality in, in charge. He seems to be a more colorless figure. Uh, sort of doing things in a stealth Maybe way. more incrementally. Yeah. Right, and using people's apathy in the internet and stuff to kind of just It's definitely a deep stuff. conservatism. I mean, there's the, they don't hide, you know, it's an ideological right. position that uh, they put forward and people right. vote for it or don't. Yeah. It, seems, it seems less a crusading like the way, you know, Reagan kind of in his Hollywood ways, like messianic, you know, it seems less American. But there's another weird element to the... To the uh, like for me, it's always I feel like it's a win for the good guys somehow that Hedvig is doing as well as yeah, it is. yeah. But I also feel like it's weird. I was watching. I think it was when I was I saw Neil Patrick Harris on Conan or something, mm-hmm. and um and and talking about Hedvig, and I was thinking, huh, it's weird. We spent a decade and a half thinking this is really subversive, and it's not subversive it's not anymore. Really. It's mainstream, and, yeah, and which is great. But is that strange for you? Um, it's a little odd. Um, it's funny because I'm working on the sequel, which is much weirder and would not be on Broadway, you know, maybe in 15 years again. But it is odd, and I don't really uh, participate in the usual uh, social media or, you know, I don't really know what's going on in terms of the real pop way. Why not? Because most of it I don't like. Right. You know, I was, you know, it's funny. Good answer. Because yeah. when Hedvig came out, we were on some of those shows, and it was a, a big deal. Um, and we, people had to fight for us, and others were uncomfortable with us there. Like, for example, Rosie O'Donnell and Bill Maher really loved us, and she had to fight in the studio to get a, a drag character on a daytime television show. But she was like, we got a drag queen throwing a chair on Jerry Springer, and he didn't want right. a drag queen singing right. about love. It's like, mm. she was cool. She was like, come on in, and uh, gave us a set. And then David Letterman, they you know, there was a whole voice from the booth saying, don't remove the wig during the song. I was like, who are you and what do you mean? <laughs> it's like, don't remove the wig during the song. So I removed the wig, wig after the song and they cut it out because they wanted, they didn't want people to get letters and saying, what do you got a drag queen on wow. the show? And Letterman didn't really shake my hand after that and everything. It's like, I don't know if that, that was him or just the producers, but it was... It was uh, nervous. It's remarkable. We're just talking about a decade and a decade yeah, and a half. Yeah, it was ago, just right? like '98, um, and then Conan O'Brien was totally cool, you know. Or Bill Maher was singing the song on on his show. So it's like it was a, it was fun, to, but it's fun to be, you know, the uh, the unusual person. Uh, I also had been a mainstream actor up until then, so I knew different worlds, and I grew up in the Army, so I was used to moving around in different kinds of worlds. Mm. You mentioned social media. I mean, you've also said a couple of times so far in this interview that you don't think Hedwig would have, Hedwig would have been made or... The movie. Uh, uh, I see. The play you would have you could have yeah. done today, but uh, how, how would the social media world have affected... Uh, Hedvig had it been just debuting now. I mean, that, that's one thing that didn't exist 16 yeah. years ago. How do you think that would have changed things? You know, I'm I'm of two minds about all that. You know, I'm still an, I'm a kind of an old cranky guy where I'm like, wow, you know, I feel differently when I had to really look for a couple of years for that album and listen to it, as opposed to but like but I listen and listen to something else while I'm listening. Oh well, classic album. I feel nothing. You know, yeah. so. Finding the show, making our flyers, sending them in the mail, uh, fi- curating our audience, slowly building an audience uh, from nothing because it was an unusual type of show was fun. you know. And I was doing sitcoms and Broadway shows and TV shows, MacGyvers, between doing Hedvig. Mm. So for me, it was a relief from the bullshit. I would run off with the MacGyver money and get a wig, you know, and have, <laughs> you know, and do that. So 
I like the do DIY thing. You could say this digital DIY too, but there's the overload of information. You know, the the uh, the white noise really does uh, compromise how you feel about what you're get what you're absorbing. You know, and how you absorb it. You half absorb yeah. it because you're doing two things, and I'm sure someone's doing something as they're listening to this. And that you know, not only that, but you may change your opinion about something, or your your opinion may be affected by what you're reading while you're what you know. Yeah. It's like the Oscars aren't the Oscars anymore. The Oscars are what everybody's chatting about on Twitter while the Oscars are happening. Exactly. Right? Who's what? I mean, I was I was at home with my mom who has Alzheimer's, and she's a lovely, lovely person, and she's um, in in as almost a kind of a Zen place. You know, there's a there's a uh, I'm learning about, in a way, how to be from from my parents having having uh, you know having some memory issues, and it's a strange gift. But there's also I was just turning on the TV there, and my film Rabbit Hole came up on regular TV, and it was so weird because I'd never seen a film that way on TV in a long time. But also, like, pretty much it was a commercial after every scene. And that's, you know, I'm like, are people actually watching this movie or are they just right. switching it? Or are the older people staying on it, watching all the commercials too? I was like, there's no way you can absorb this. It must be so hard for older people to fit into this when people aren't even calling on the phone anymore and they can't do anything except online. I feel like it's a very isolating thing, all of this stuff. And kids it's a false intimacy that comes with uh social media that mm. you know my friend simon amstel a comedian who was just at ne uh, north by mm -hmm. brilliant guy someone was texting in front in the front row of his show and he's like <laughs> i'm here are you tweeting she's like no i'm texting he's like you're admitting it and i'm right here and you know i understand that you know the feeling of justifying your existence someone's texting you but it's real and you're texting you know, it's like we're actually existing and it's like but you know all those people who are texting you are really people who don't want to talk to you what if she was texting simon is incredible i'm in the front row this is the most amazing thing get down here she missed the best joke while she was doing it right you know that's the danger by the way i love the idea that macgyver helped create the conditions and resources for Hedwig to happen. <laughs> there's some beautiful yes. somehow some delicious karmic uh irony or, or energy in there uh, why aren't you more of a control freak about Hedwig? It, it was, it's so much a part of you why aren't you sort of i'm a iron control freak the, uh, the, the 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 broadway production i'm a perfectionist when i do when i'm doing what i'm doing but I try to do it in a, a group group way. Like, what do you think, you know? But I do like to have the final say on my movies and things, which is hard to get. Because um, I was lucky at the beginning, and later it's less so, in terms of the uh, economics. Um, but it's felt like it's already done. And I know as an actor, when I'm getting micromanaged by a director, you don't get a, a good result. You know, you, a director going, say it like this usually freezes an actor up so i don't do it to anyone else i'm like do your production you know right. there's 12 hedvigs in your production in san francisco great you're in korea why would i tell you what to do in korea the jokes the duh, you know it's like korea it's huge i think partly because of the divided country you know the east and west german north south korea it's like, I don't know, just do what you want to do with it, you know. I love to take other people's plays and it do... It wouldn't bother you if you went to see a production of it that you really didn't like? No, that didn't I've done speak that. To you? No? I've seen that. I don't go to see it. I'm not <laughs> you don't go to I'm see it. I'm not interested. I enjoyed the production on Broadway because I was part of it. I was rewriting lines. Right. I was working on animation. But you don't turn up at the, no. the local production of... That's creepy. That's John like Neely O'Hara... That's like, that's like Valley of the Dolls, singing to your own jukebox <laughs> song. Neil Patrick Harris, he's he's got so much acclaim for doing this. He just recently announced that he's not going to um, extend his run. Yeah, as Hedvig, and he's had no life for years. Is that what it? What, what, what what's his? You know, there's this notion that we knew him from as Doogie Howser, and then we knew him from How How I Met Your Mother. 
uh, did, did he? Why did he take this role? Do you think? What did he tell you about that? Oh well, I'd met him over the years once in a while since the mid mid nineties and uh, since the early nineties because he came to short bus. Uh, sorry, short bus. He came to the Secret Garden, which I was doing on Broadway, and we met him after, and he's really sweet. And it's like he's one of those guys who came up in, in television, but was dreaming of theater. It's like, how can I get there? You know, years of... Uh, that's interesting. Yeah, it's it's very... That's why I love him. And he uh, came to... I said, why don't you see the second show today and just stand in this little corner backstage and see how we do it all? And he was a kid, you know, and or maybe 18 or something. And he... Uh, he did, and it was he was. I just saw him. We'd go in and off stage, and there he was, just kind of sitting in the corner. And like he loved everything about it. And did and, you know of his multi talents at the time? No, you just knew he no. was. No, then I saw him right? on stage right. a few years later, and I was like, "This guy is good." Yeah. And he was he was doing some prat fall or something. He's like a real athlete, you know, Buster Keaton type. Like he loves the mechanics of things, and he's a magician and. He, the challenge, you know, leap over the dent. He loves to make it harder for himself. He's I, actually a magician? He's an actually, he's the Neil president. Patrick Harris is a magician? He's the president of the Magic Castle, which is the big L.A. Oh, society. Right. Um, and he directed a magic, uh, this modern magic show in off-Broadway recently. But he's, uh, I'm like, I want to make it easier on me. I want the to have lower heels as the character. <laughs> I don't want to have to shave. I'm just like, I'm more, I'm not that. I'm not like, give me another car to jump over. You know, it's like he, he is. And it's frightening what he can do on stage I, that I can't. Um, I'm I'm worried if I ever have to play the role. But he's reinvented himself. Yes. Right? Well, that's what, that's the thing. It's like we we thought he was the perfect person to bring Hedvig to all those people who thought they might not like it. Hmm. All the people who love it are going to come anyway. But he said, cause, because he works a lot of angles, you know, grandmas love him, kids, gays, straight. He's like Mr. Show Business. It's true. You know, I, he's so charming, you know, and not, I wouldn't say he's not threatening because he's got this deviousness, which is very Hedvig too. Uh, but he, people don't, they aren't. They they come saying, "Oh, he's going to show us something." That but we... if Neil Patrick Harris is out to show that he's not a one trick pony, which he's more than done in terms right. of all the, do you do you feel the same way too? I mean, is Rabbit Hole is short bus? Are, are you looking for ways to not only be defined by Hedvig, which has been such a major part of who and what you are for the last couple of decades? Well, you know, I've always that's the thing that's most well known. But um, I had been doing acting for. 20 years before it in all kinds of interesting things, you know, and even they were, though they were less famous, they were fun. So I already kind of knew myself and Hedvig helped me know more. But interestingly, I didn't, I stopped acting after Hedvig because it used up everything I had, you know, like acting for me was finding out who I was through roles. And then once I would play that kind of role, I didn't need to do it again or the, so it was like, I don't really need to act anymore. But I love the writing, directing. I'm sure I'll act again, but it has to be special. Girls was fun. You know, it was like kind of a lark and a hoot. Lena Dunham's awesome. But I don't, you know, I move on to I'm sure I'll end up writing novels, and that's it. Because you don't need millions of dollars to be raised to do novels. Um, I'd like to make an album. But Neil did want to challenge himself uh, also in terms of his masculinity. You know, growing up in Hollywood uh, and being closeted, there was a fear. There was like, oh, God, you know, everyone is just judging you. And and then when he came out, it was like, I have to, I'm sure he felt the pressure of having to be the, the gay guy who was already in the system. Um, and so his growing up, when you're gay in that world, your masculinity is super important. And I remember when I was younger, I was kind of butcher, you know what I mean? Because I was always on guard as an actor. It's like, I have to be able to play different roles, right? And, right. and my dad was military and, you know, you got to cover. It's the same if you're Jewish, I'm sure, and like trying to 
pass, you know, in the 50s, you know, or whatever, you know. And it's all the same. That's why all the humor from the different uh, groups makes sense. It's about passing and it's about exaggeration. Acceptance. And, yeah, and, and, yeah, Jewish humor, black humor is different because you can't pass as usually as much. You know, it's a different thing. But it's like all I love all the different kinds of humor. So with Neil, it was like, I need to challenge that. I need to be play a character who's challenged too. And I need to use and so he was like, he needed to be scared, and he was scared doing this. Terrified, in fact. And he triumphed. Mm. You know, and he's set himself up as the king of Broadway. He can do anything, you know, and it's like he does the sketch comedy, you know, online, funny or die. It's like he can do anything, and he will, because unlike a lot of people in L.A. who get very lazy with their success, he just keeps trying more things. I talked about the the global conversation around gender and sexuality that's 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 happening. It really does feel like it's an international conversation yeah. from World Pride here to Pussy Riot in Moscow to yes. you know what's happening in Africa, etc. Uh, uh, you said something really interesting. You said that Hedvig is more than a woman or a man. She's a gender of one, and that is accident accidentally so beautiful. I, I wonder how political you feel Hedvig is today. I don't really feel... It's interesting because there's a lot of, you know, discussion of trans uh, labels and, fo and transphobia and confusions and... Uh, and it seems a little, as my Mexican friend said, first world problems. Mm. Um, but, the, you know, labels are important, um, especially when you're young. You know, like I need to know who I, I need to say who I am. I am an, you know, Chinese Canadian. I am an American, African. I, you know, it's like people need that at first. And then you let go of them because you're really only you. But it's good at first because you feel tribal a little bit. And uh, I needed that, and that's what gay pride things were for me. I don't really need gay pride parade anymore, but some people, it's very important at a certain times. So for me, Hedwig was always a metaphor, and queer people, which covers, you know, trans, drag, gay, lesbian, bisexual, any any kind of thing under the queer umbrella, which usually means looking at the world f through a a prism of gender uh, and otherness, whether it's sexual or not, everyone knows that there is a metaphor with Hedvig. She's forced into this operation. It's coerced. It's not a choice. She, Hedvig doesn't speak for any trans community because she was, you know, mutilated. Right. Um, and then, like, okay, this is what I have to work with is the line. Someone says, what is that down there? It's what I have to work with. And everyone knows that moment where it's like, what is this? Oh, it's what I have to work with. Do I fit in here? And uh, all right, I'm going to make the best of this. And then I'm going to trust someone and they're going to destroy me. <laughs> and then I'm going to either die or I'm going to, I'm going to, absorb them and that experience and create something more whole. Now, the, me the metaphor of the origin of love is that we were cut in half mm. and we we're seeking the other half, which is a sad way to think about love, you know, as incomplete, but everyone understands it. In Korea, they understand it. In Turkey, they understand it. And in Brazil, they understand that myth, even if they don't understand Christianity. Um, and it's so gratifying to get that common base of experience of like, it's, Hedvig is not a trans voice, you know, she's not a gay voice. Gay was the least of her problem, you know what I mean? It's like, it's like, it is the other, you know, I am not, I don't belong here on earth, in this country, in this planet, in this school, in this body, what do I do? Who am I? Everyone understands that. And interestingly, the sequel to Hedvig is all about, I know who I am, and I have very little time left. Wow. Which I was is gonna ask you about the second sequel. half of your life. And you say that gets more strange. It's much more hallucinogenic. It's much darker. It's much more 
death, 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 God, God, God. When do we expect to see that? I don't know. Is that informed by your parents? Yes, it's informed by being 51, mm -hmm. you know, and seeing people die and uh, trying to understand it. And understand, having been brought up with a very specific Catholic view of God, uh, reinvestigating that from a non-religious point of view and um, a metaphoric point of view, but still using the myth of the or origin of love and extending the, the metaphor. By the way, uh, identity issues and, and transphobia, I don't think of that as in the category of first world problems I roll. I mean, I, I, I think first, no, world, the first label world problems part, are like, my oh, computer's no. not working fast uh, enough. You know, like, No, like, it's really more, it's more like the label stuff. It's like cisgender, trans, you know, like all those things. For example, there's a, a female, there's a, uh, in the U.S., a female only uh, music festival. And that was challenged by trans men, female to male. And they're like, oh, right, because that's a new th newer thing in terms of numbers of people. So these 60s-based people who set it up are like, oh, okay, well, it should be for um, women, people who were had a girlhood. You know, they were biological. It's like, well, what about our trans female friends? And then they were like, th th their minds were exploding. You know what I mean? Because it was like they felt they needed that at a certain time, yeah. right, to feel safe. And there's an ever-evolving lexicon. Too, Ultimately, right? the yeah. party should have everybody in it. Right. But that's their house. You know, it's not the same as job discrimination. How do you force someone to – it's like saying you have to have an abortion. You know, it's like there's a kind of like, oh, God, those – my Mexican friend says we're first world problems because in the other world, they're still like got to get the food and the job and the... <laughs> right. And, right. But it's then the, survival. But then the trans person in that, in that place is at risk much more in Mexico City. You know, so you're right. It's, it's, it's really... I'm really enjoying talking to you. I wish <laughs> we could do this for longer. You must come back. Mm -hmm. Certainly with the sequel. Yeah. You better come back. Uh, I was going to go out on some music. Um, I mentioned this to uh, the Hedwig and the Angry Inch sing along at uh, Tiff Lightbox. I, was, I thought we'd go out with something from the Hedwig film soundtrack. Now, I'm a sucker for Wicked Little Town. That's like my, I, I just think it's a beautiful pop song. Yes, it is. And, 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 and pay, with pathos. I mean, are you okay with that or is there something? You, you, oh, yeah. No, I like people saying it's good. I don't, if you said it was an accomplished song, <laughs> I wouldn't like that. <laughs> No, it's an accomplished <laughs> composer. Uh, such a pleasure. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> 